don't know about you, but I think we all do. We tend to get lazy, especially when it comes to God. We tend to get lazy sometimes. We tend to take things for granted. It's it's the human way, you know. It's you know, blame Adam if you want to, but we tend to get lazy sometimes. We tend to get used to things, and every once in a while, we need someone to come stir things up, to some shake things up, and that's what Haggai was. He came because what? And I, you, most of you know the story, but I'll tell you real fast again. What happened was they all came back, and their their houses were very nice, and the church was in ruins. And Haggai was like, "What's up?" What's, what's wrong with this picture here? You know, you got your lives down pretty good, but my work is failing. And, and so he kind of woke the f folks up. He was up, a smack in the face, as it were. And God used, here's the thing, here's the thing. God used him to stir others up, and then the others stirred the rest up. And that's kind of what God does. What God will sometimes do, I'll say it that way. In my experience and in the Bible as I've read it, what God will sometimes do, He'll stir one person or two. He'll, he'll get one or two people on fire. And then from them, others will begin to catch fire. And before you know it, you have a big fire going. I think it was John West, I can't remember which, who said, I will, I will catch fire and then let others watch me burn. A fire of zeal. A fire of love for God. Uh, and, and such. And the, God will touch someone, whether you're, a, a, sometimes I've seen when, when you're speaking or teaching, when you're a worship leader, sometimes you wonder, is, is anybody catching fire? And suddenly one will catch fire. Mm -hmm. One. And, and you may be that one. You may be that one. And one catches fire. And before you know it, others around you begin to also catch the fire of love for God or zeal for God or whatever you want to call it. Well, Haggai's that way. You got that little sheet in front of you? I, got, I want to tell you a couple things before we look at some of the Bible verses. The thing about a prophet is, the prophet, you ever heard those jokes that say, I got bad news and good news? Well, this is not a joke, but that's often what the prophet did. He had bad news and good news. Well, give me the bad news first. The prophet always gave you the bad news first, which was judgment. But it was more than that, by the way. But a prophet would always say, well, here's the bad news. The bad news is, we're shot. The bad news is we're in trouble. The bad news is if we continue this way, we're going to hell. The bad news is God's judgment is coming. Whoa, that's bad news. Got the good news? Well, then the prophet would secondly give them good news. The good news, God will bring us back. You see, sometimes you go through the valleys to get to the mountains. As we said about Brother Jerry there, uh, when he gave his word. Some, and it's not just him, it's all of us, but he gave help us, reminded us. Sometimes you got to go through the mess to get to the message. Sometimes you got to go through a test to get to the testimony. And sometimes you got to go through a failure to get to the success. I don't like it, but that seems to be the way it is. And you know what? You got to enjoy the ride. And so just like there's going to be time for God to be blessed, there's going to be times when we will be failing him. And we got to ride that ride out because his blessing is coming back. There's going to be times when we're going to experience judgment or correction or discipline from God. I don't like them. You know how the adults say when they give their little child a little spanking or something? This is going to hurt me more than you. Well, I always never never understood that. never really liked that. That's true. It hurts me more than you. God's judgment is not where he's saying, I'm going to take it out on you. No. God's saying, I've got restoration. God sees us better than we see ourselves, I believe. God has eternal plans for us. We often have just temporaries. Well, the prophet says it this way. And in fact, uh, the, the prophet Haggai, and I'm on line three if you're following along here, uh, his message consisted of five different little sermons, and he put dates on them. And so all in uh, 520 B.C., which is a long time ago. But he put those dates in them from August to December, right about now. He, of the 3,000 years ago, he had a little word. He said, um, I'm just facetious here, an example. On October the 19th, 2014, God told me to tell you this. Cool. And he gave the word. Then on October 26, 2014, and here comes the word. That's the way the little book there in the Old Testament goes. It's five little words from God. Uh, and they are dated and they are brief and to the point. Some people think a sermon's got to be really long. No. It doesn't have to be real long now. If you're not saying anything, maybe you should keep talking until you say something. But generally, I'll give you a good example. I've used this before, but if you don't mind using it again. The difference between a sermon and a message. Here's a sermon. And I've done this before, so don't mind me. A sermon is this. Hello, one and all. We're 
glad to see you here this morning. I would like to inform you that as you sit in your seats, currently some combustion is going on in the back there on the roof. And uh, it's catching on to the dry tile and the building's being to be, beginning to be engulfed in flames. It would be to your advantage to rise up from your seat and go to the nearest exit. Or I could say, fire! Now the first one's the sermon, the second one's the message. The first one is a lot of words, you know, and when we have to do those sometimes. But the second one is a message from God. And you don't have to, it doesn't necessarily have to require a lot of words to say it. Sometimes it's to the point. It's to the point. Well, it's like when I went to the doctor and I saw a little chart, and according to the chart, I'm, I'm morbidly obese. <laughs> it's like, well, that's pretty much to the point. <laughs> that, did, that chart didn't beat around the bush, did it? You know? Uh, uh, but that's the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. The truth will hurt us sometimes before it heals us. Hey guys, that way. And so it's very brief, very dated, to the point messages. And in fact, I put there, if you want this little book in the Old Testament in summer, here it is. Here's that one book in one sense. Stop and think. Rise up and do something. Stop and think about what you're doing, then get up and do something about it. That's what this little prophet, see, God brings this little prophet along, and, and like he does in your lives, he'll bring a person along who will basically tell you, hey, stop, think about what you're doing, and get up and do something about it. And then they go away. Well, that's the servant of God. That's a, a good message from God to do. And so I gave you, and, and this she got, what happens is the people were saying this. The people were saying, you know, things are so hard, I don't have time for God in his house. And the prophet came along and said, because you don't have time for God in his house, that's why things are hard. He turned it around. That's Haggai. They were saying, look, we would do more for God, but you know what? It's just hard to do it. It's times are tough. The prophet came and said, hey, the reason why times are tough is because you're not getting around and getting, doing God's business. You do God's business and watch how God turns your life around. You see, when we do God's business, he begins to turn our life around. What does Haggai do? Haggai does what all prophets do. He brings God's reality to this present time. To this present time. This time, this point in time, this place in space. Or as we learned in Korean school this morning, uh, is it Jigun? Now? Now. Jigun. This point in time. This place <coughs> in space. We learned another one too, by the way. Uh, Onyu? Today? Ah, this point in time, now, today, that's what the prophet does. He takes God and heaven and all the stuff that we have these concepts about and says, October 19, 2014, here's where it is. It's about today. I'm not talking about something way back 3,000 years ago. I'm not talking about something in heaven that you haven't seen yet. I'm talking about when you get in your car and you leave the church today. You need to stop and think about it and get up and do something about it. That's the prophet. There are a couple of big names in the book, and just Zerubbabel, Joshua. The reason I put them in there is because one man was a political leader, one man was a church leader, and God had words for them. But the biggest name, you know what the biggest name in the book of Haggai is? <coughs> Yahweh, Jehovah. It appears 32 times. God's the big person in the book, as he is in all things. See, God speaks to everybody. God speaks to everybody. But sometimes God speaks to you. And I don't know when and how that happens. But sometimes God speaks to the whole group and says, hey, here's a little word from the Bible for the whole church. Cool. And it applies to different people different ways. You know? But then sometimes it's as if, who can I pick on? Carrie. Ah, and he says, here's a word for you. Ah, and it's like, wow, he's speaking just to me. Wow, he didn't know. Of course not. God did. And that's kind of the way it works. God speaks to everybody, and then somebody speaks to you. Let's do a quick run. Do you mind? I hope you don't, because in the book of Haggai, I just want to do a quick run. I'm not going to read every single word, but here's where we are up till today. So let's look, and Gilbert's going to stay up with me, because we're going fast through this thing in the book of Haggai. Here we go. Ready? It started in the second year, Darius, six month, uh, and this is all, uh, August 21st, two, uh, 520 B.C. And the word of the Lord came to Haggai, and here's what thus said the Lord. These people say the time isn't here yet. It's not time to start working for God again. The people said it's not time to work for God again. But in verse 3, the word of the Lord came to Haggai and said, 
Is it time for you to dwell in nice houses while the house of God needs repair? Is it time for you to live in such nice houses while my work suffers? So in verse 5 he says, this is what God says. Give careful thought to your ways. Think about what you're doing. You've planted a whole lot, but you don't get much to return. You never have enough. You drink, but you're never full. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn money and jobs, but then your, your purse has a hole in it. So he's saying is there's no satisfaction in your life. No satisfaction. So the Lord says, give careful thought to what you're doing. If there's no satisfaction in life, look at your life. Go up to the mountains and bring down wood and build my house, says the Lord. I want to be honored. God says, start taking care of my business. I would encourage you before we read on here, start taking care of God's business. Start seeking first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. It is righteousness. Let's see what these things that are added to you. Put God first a little bit in your life and see what happens. Because he says, look, you expected a whole lot, but it turns out to be little. Whatever you did bring home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house remains a ruin. But all of you are busy about all your own business. God says, I wanted to get your attention. So in verse 10, here's how he does it. Because the heavens have withheld its crops, God says, I'll send a drought. A drought, it got our attention in California, hasn't it? It's gotten people's attention. God says, I'm going to send a drought. And all this is going to happen and all, it's all going to affect your very life. You know what? If we ran out of drinking water, our very lifestyles will change, for instance. And it does affect us. We have to have drinking water. Oh. God says, hey, if, if, the, the way, if, you, if, if you won't take care of what I'm needing, then I'll show you how much you depend on what I give you. You know, so many things. Like Anyway, but God goes on. So then this, this uh, governor guy and the high priest guy and everybody, they did something about it. They obeyed the voice of the prophet and the people feared the Lord. Here's the thing before we read the next verse. So the prophet speaks and says, hey, look at the business. You need help. And, and, and look at your lives. Your lives aren't satisfied. So the people said, you know what? He's right. And they started working. And they started. And why? Because they feared the Lord. It wasn't a matter of any person. It was God. And, and, and the question comes to me, and you ask yourself, do I fear God more than anything or anyone else? And if I begin to really fear God, it will show a change in my life. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. It is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord. So in verse 13, here comes another word. God says, think about what you're doing. Okay, second message. I'm with you. I'm with you. That gives, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, that puts strength in my soul. When God says, hey, I'm with you. I'm with you. That suddenly makes me feel strong. And so, yeah, my spirit starts to stir up. And this guy, his spirit stood up. And all these people, and they began to work on the house on that 24th day, September 21st. <laughs> now they got strength going. Let's read on as they get the strength going. And now chapter 2. And here comes another word. And here comes the next word. And he says, did you remember how it used to be? Now you're building this house. Do you remember how it looks and, and what you got now? Remember we talked last week? The past doesn't compare to the present. It's like nothing. We'll just read on here if you don't mind. But now he says, be strong. Be strong, you guys, and work. Again, I'm with you. When God says he's with us, we have strength. You know what God says? He says to you this morning, I'm with you. You want to live the Christian life? You know what God says? I'm with you. I can help you do that. You want to be a good person? You know what God says? I'm with you. I can help you do that. You want to be a blesser, one who encourages others and raises a situation up wherever you come? God says, I'm with you. I can help you do that. You want to be selfish? You want to be uh, self-centered? You want to be a hateful person? God says, I'm not with you. <laughs> I can't help you do that. I will not help you do that. You want to be this stuff? I'm with you. And I'll stir your spirit. And this is why I agreed with the, your, your forefathers. And my spirit comes, stays with you. The Holy Spirit is God's inner strength for us that never goes away. God gives us an all the time strength in the Holy Spirit. Church will end. The meal at lunchtime will finish. Sooner or later, each of us will go home, wherever home is. But we do not leave God here. We do not leave God with the pastor or the Bible. The God of the Holy Spirit, God is in us. God the Holy Spirit is in us. And therefore, I'm not afraid. Are you afraid? Don't be afraid. God is with you. And then the prophet goes on in verse 6. 
So here's what the Lord says. In a little bit, I'm going to shake the world. There's a shaking coming. You know, they just talked about in the California history, what was it, 25 years ago this week, the big earthquake over there in Oakland or wherever. Oh, yeah. What's it called? Loma, Loma Prieto or something. I know. But it was a big earthquake 25 years ago. You remember during the World Series game, if you remember that. Big earthquake, huh? 1989. Yeah. Is that where the Giants lost? Yeah, the day. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, the, <laughs> the big earthquake, it shook. And that was a big earthquake for us. Small beans compared to what God says he's going to do. God says, I'm going to shake heaven and the earth. I'm going to shake. There's a shaking going right now among all nations, isn't there? I don't know about you, but I can feel it. Can't you feel it? Read the paper, see the news. You see the shaking going on, man? There's a shaking going on. And Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, he had nothing on this one. Whole lot of shaking. There's a whole lot of shaking going on here. And God says, and that that is desired by all, that's him, will come. And I will fill this house with glory. Don't you go, okay, things are really bad. I'm going to hold on to my money. God says it all belongs to me. The silver and gold is mine. Don't, don't hold on. You're going to let go of it anyway. Don't, don't hold on to it tightly. And the glory of this house is going to be greater than before. Can I stop here for a minute? God's saying, I think to you, the glory he will get from you is going to be even greater than what's happened in your past. The prayers that he will answer in your future are going to be even greater than the prayers he's answered in your past. The Christ-likeness he has duplicated in your life in the future will be even more Christ-like than that from the past. You're going to grow. Proverbs 4, verse 18. The path of the righteous is like a shining light getting brighter and brighter. He says it's going to get brighter and brighter. And I will give you peace, says the Lord. And now, verse 10. We're reading through the whole book. Watch this. This is not much. Another word comes. And here's what the word comes. And now, we keep on going around and reword these verses. 12, 13. Keep on rolling. 13, 14, uh, 15. Go to, there we go. So, God says basically, from last week, Remember, if you touch something holy, does that make you holy? No. But if you touch something dirty, does that make you dirty? Yes, in the law it does. And God says it's sort of the same way with me. He's saying you can't get holiness because you're sitting next to somebody who's holy right now. But you can sure catch sin from this world. You hang around people and they can bring you down. He said they can bring you down. So you got to watch out. So here's what the Lord then says. Give, again, give careful thought. Think about what you're doing. Think about what you're doing. I struck, and he says, so I notice I allow things that happen to you when you did not pay attention to me. God has a way of getting our attention if we're not paying attention to him. You know what my pastor used to say? My pastor said sometimes the only way God gets some people's attention is, is by laying them out flat on their back. And then he finally pulls up a chair and says, now that I have your attention, may I speak with you. Sometimes God has to do that to us in certain circumstances. He has to get our attention. So in verse 18, Here's what he says. From this day on, give careful thought. Is there any anything left in the barn, tree, anything else? From this day on, I'll start blessing you. Whatever you got, give it to me. I'll bless you. And she, you don't have to have a whole lot. God says, I'll take what little you got, and I'll bless you because of it. And now the final word from verse 20. So here's the last word. This is in December of that year, by the way. Last word. Here you go. He says, I have one more word. I will overturn and all these other powers. I will overthrow all this other stuff. And on that day, I will take you, this is the leader, the governor, and I will make you like my signet ring. I have chosen you, says the Lord. God said, I have a word for you particularly. I picked on Kerry earlier. I'm going to continue picking on Kerry. I know he won't mind. It's like God says, okay, Zion Church, um, consider your ways and I'm with you and, and I'm strong and you carry you I raise up to be and, and, and that's what he did he, he spoke to the group the Israel but then he speaks to the one just like maybe sometimes you come to church doesn't have to happen every Sunday it may not ever happen I don't know sometimes it's like God speaks to you and it's like you know what I felt the call of God that day to me well this guy Zerubbabel he felt the call of God. God said, 
I'll make you like my signature ring. Back in those days, what they did was the leader had a ring. And so like if you were to write a document, uh, scribble out on it, writing was just being invented back then, you would write it and then you would roll it up and you'd get some old wax, melted wax, and you would uh, melt it on there and seal it. And then whoever would put their ring and impress it, it was like a signature and it stayed sealed. And if it was a message for you, Sarah, it could not be opened until Sarah broke the seal. Oh, it's from Tom. I see his signature on the wax. And so what God is saying to this man is, I'm going to make you the person who basically is in charge of my work around here. And by the way, in Revelation, when he breaks the seals, that's what it's talking about. God has these sealed documents and they break one by one. Nowadays, we... If, what little type of people don't mail much anymore, but when you do, you lick the thing and you seal it, that's a seal. You break the seal. God says, you, carry. I'll pick one you brought up one. I will make you my signet ring. I have chosen you. God says, I have chosen you. I have chosen you. He speaks the word to each one individually. Haggai is a wake up. Wake up! That's Haggai. I put in your notes a couple of verses from the New Testament. He says, wake up. Will you read with me? These are not on your wall. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Knowing the time, it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Wake up! It's almost here. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34. Listen to these words. Wake up to righteousness and do not sin because some people do not know God. Wake up to righteousness. And finally, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14, listen to these words. Awake, you who are sleeping, and rise from the dead. Christ will give you life. Awake, you who are sleeping, and rise from the dead. Christ will give you life. This world has a way, and sometimes some preachers have a way of putting us to sleep. Somebody once said, if, if sermon ever puts you to sleep, go wake up the preacher. <laughs> One of my jobs is to make sure, if at all possible, make sure, if at all possible, you don't fall asleep. <laughs> Among other things. Uh, but I, I, I somewhat joke, because... We should be wide awake, and sometimes you're just tired, you work all night, or you toss all night, or whatever. But I'm glad you're awake this morning. Are you awake to God? One final word, and it's in your set of notes here. Haggai, as we say goodbye to, we say goodbye to Haggai, as we say goodbye to Haggai, a little prophet who woke us up. I thought of a quote I read somewhere, because here's the thing about Haggai. He never really saw the result of his work. We never do, do we? I think I, again, I'm getting old. I've been here long enough. I start repeating myself. But I like my story. Some of them I really like. And I think I told you, but I'd like to repeat my story from Hurricane Fran, 1996. Hurricane Fran, 1996. I was living in Dunn, North Carolina. Yeah, as you know, Carolina is the alley of hurricanes sometimes. September the 3rd, 1996. And I was living in Dunn, North Carolina, and I had never really experienced that close up a hurricane I did that night. Even as I speak now, I have my hair standing up. It was, it was scary. It was scary. And I remember September 3rd, 1996, and I was at home. I videoed. I should have brought, I wish I had the video. I videoed the, why not? Yeah, I'm outside, and you can hear the wind. It sounds like a train, or worse. You can't see because all the electricity's out. And they run small, but there were still people driving. Trucks would go by the road, and you go going in the rain. And, uh, and then I stopped video. I went inside. And actually, at that point, the lights weren't off. And then I heard, and I can't even mimic it, but I'll try my best. I was sitting in the living room. And all of a sudden, I heard a really huge, but it was about 50 times louder than that. A huge boom, and the house shook. I had no idea what it was. And then the lights went out. And it's and then here's what's even scarier. And then the, the rain subsided and it calmed down. It's over. 
And about 15 minutes later, you heard it starting up again. It was the eye. The eye came directly over Dunn, North Carolina. And the storm began, and then it started up again. And it was hard. And I, I went to bed. I, I don't know how much I slept that night. I went to bed. Woke up the next morning. You know what that loud boom was? September 3rd, 1996. It was harvest time. I had a pecan tree in the backyard that was loaded with pecans. So when it got wet, it got really heavy. And it just flipped right over, right between the house and the garage and hit the ground. I got pictures of it. All the root system up and out and a huge hole in the ground. Pecan tree. Then I got my camera and got in the car and started riding around. I wanted to film some damage. And one of the men I visited in our church, he had lived in the house all his life. He had pecan trees, about 12 of them in his front yard, huge ones. And I pulled up to his house, and I think all but about three of them were down. All but three of them were down. And I got up on the front porch, didn't say anything, and he was sitting in his white rocker, little white, what do you call it, wooden rocker chair. He was sitting in the front porch, that white rocker, just crying up a storm. Just sitting there crying, crying, crying. And I, didn't, I knew sometimes it's best not to say anything, so I didn't say anything. I just sat with him a little bit, rocking in the chair. He just crying away. You know what he finally said? He said, you don't grow these overnight. You don't grow these overnight. And I put a little quote in the bottom of your sheet there. It says, we plant sequoias. Wendell Berry said that. <clears throat> Souls aren't made overnight. Prophet comes and he does his little work and stirs people up. And then a lot of times it takes years and years to see the fruit. In our lives, it does. It takes years to see fruit. But don't get discouraged if you don't see results right now. Keep at it. Keep going towards God. Keep going towards God. Hey, God reminds us of that. Hey, keep going. Think about what you're going and keep going towards God. Fruit's coming. It's coming. So I hope that the word of prophet is not all a bad word. I hope it's an encouraging word to you this morning before we go to lunch. Hey, would you stand with me?